very delighted to be here. Unlike some of my fellow panel members, I never actually thought I would find myself sitting in this seat in this wonderful building. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this was the real Supreme Court? <laughs> <laughs> it's been fantastic, yeah, Jesus. Absolutely. With me but... heading it. Can you imagine? <laughs> That's the <important. laughs> So <laughs> that is the wonderful so, thing. So I couldn't resist that. So. <laughs> That is the wonderful thing about a career in the law, is that it's full of unexpected surprises. You never know what's around the corner. But looking back now, I realise that I was actually one of the very fortunate people who, from a very early age, knew exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. I think it all started with a sort of fascination for television programmes about law and lawyers. But without really knowing what I was letting myself in for, at the ripe old age of 14, I announced to my parents that I wanted to be a lawyer. So again, very fortunately, my mum and dad were very, very supportive, but they didn't know any lawyers and they had no idea at all how to go about becoming one. So very sensibly, they suggested that I should write to the Law Society <laughs> to find out more about it, which I duly did. And no disrespect, but to be honest, um, when I got the reply, I was none the wiser. I got a huge <laughs> envelope, about three inches thick, totally unintelligible to a 14-year-old, I'm afraid. But I wasn't put off, and I do remember thinking that if lawyers are clever enough to understand all this, then I definitely want to be one. And... Um, here I am. <laughs> but as it turned out, that wasn't the only time that I had to stick to my guns because having a sort of aptitude for languages, um, my teachers then almost went out of their way to deter me from being a lawyer and they were very persuasive and tried to convince me that I should do languages, should do classics, and that teaching would be a good career for a woman and a much better career for a woman than being a lawyer. But even at that ripe old age, I wasn't put off. So the very first top tip that I would like to pass on to you is be determined. I think Sally's already said that. Don't let anybody put you off. If you know that it's right for you, go for it and go for it big time because having a passion and having determination will get you a very, very long way. So having got over these initial hurdles, actually my route then to becoming a solicitor was actually quite traditional, as, as Deborah said, quite traditional, uh, quite straightforward actually. Um, college of Law, uh, a law degree, College of Law, articles as it was then called in private practice in my home city of Cardiff. Uh, I may have actually come across Sally at some point. <laughs> yes, possibly, yes. We're probably next door neighbours, yes, absolutely. Um, and then I was offered a job, actually, in the commercial property department of a large commercial practice in Cardiff. I was probably that commercial property lawyer that <laughs> um, we were talking about earlier. So, so far, so good. Um, but that's when I hit the next big snag, because having got that far, I really didn't like it at all, um, which was a real blow. So to put this into context, I am actually talking about a very long time ago, uh, and I was working in a firm that had very few women in it other than the more traditional secretarial roles. Um, the partner I worked for was frankly a bit of a bully, and he didn't give me any of the good, interesting, solid work. I was sort of rolled out to be the token woman at lunches and dinners, mostly with clients who were also at that time predominantly male. So I didn't really like it at all. I was explaining to uh, a colleague of mine, Amma, who's in the audience, that, it, that when I first started working, women were not allowed to wear trousers to work. And so, you know, things have moved on a bit, thank goodness. But I realized that I would have to make some changes and look for something else. But never at any point did I doubt that law was the right thing for me. I just realized that I was in the wrong place. So um, I decided to move to London to look for a different job in a different firm. So the second piece of advice that I would like to, uh, to give you is 
take responsibility for your career. No one else is as interested in your career as you are. And if something needs changing, it's down to you to change it. And you have to take responsibility for that. You can't wait for anyone else to do it for you. So at this point, actually, I learned the next very important lesson, which was never underestimate the power of luck in, in our careers. When I moved to London, I had assumed that I would find another job in another law firm and carry on as a private practice solicitor. And when the agency asked me if I would be interested in a vacancy in an oil company, I went along thinking, well, that sounds interesting, it'll be good interview experience and I'll go for it, even though I didn't really have any intention of becoming an in-house lawyer at that time. Um, in fact, unlike today, there weren't really very many in-house lawyers in those days, and my friends really thought I'd lost the plot when I told them I was going for an interview at an oil company. They thought I'd gone a bit um, off-piste. But the minute I walked through the door, I realised that it was the job for me. The atmosphere was welcoming, the people were wonderful, and they were genuinely interested in the contribution that I could make to their overall success and the well-being and future success of the company. I had a very happy 13 years there. And in fact, I've never looked back. Um, and I've spent the rest of my career so far <laughs> in-house, the last 11 years at Deloitte, where I've been fortunate enough to work on a huge variety of incredibly high quality matters with some of the country's biggest brains and most influential business people. Um, the role I have is infinitely varied. I never know from one day to the next what I'm going to be doing. It can range from partnership law, employment law, a little bit of property, still keep my hand in there. <laughs> um, uh, I, I advise on mergers, I advise on international aspects of our business, basically anything and everything that a business needs, as Deborah said, everything uh, in life, somewhere along the line, law touches that, and particularly in business. So I, I really have been very fortunate. I also uh, attend board meetings and I'm very fortunate to be in a position where I'm sort of rubbing shoulders, if you like, with the good and the great. And it's really taught me masses about business and it's enabled me to do my job as a lawyer that much better. So I suppose my last tip is keep an open mind and seize opportunities however they present themselves. The great thing about a career in the law is that there are many, many different paths that you can go down. They're all in their own way interesting and rewarding. So don't be afraid to try something new, as Sally said. Um, you know, try something out of the ordinary, a bit different. I did, and I certainly don't regret it. So finally, whatever path you do choose, I wish you your own success. Um, your own share of luck and most of all I hope you really really enjoy it and I hope you'll be as fortunate as I am in being able to look back on your career in years to come and think wow I made the right choice and I really loved every minute of it so go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've heard luck described as preparation meets an opportunity is that what you mean when well, you say luck? You can make your own luck, that's true, but sometimes, shoulders? you know, serendipity plays a part and you just have to recognise it and make the most of it. All right. Um, occasionally I'm getting a sign from Sonia about the mics. Um, never mind interpreting law, I can't interpret the mic. Um, what, what should I do? Should they be on red? Right, okay, forgive me. Um, Judy Kahn, penultimate, before we come back to Angela, who I now has had an opportunity to settle yes. down and ease into the environment. Judy Carr, can, Queen's Council. Can I just say, it really time. enhances my nerves to start off with it's going out live. <laughs> That's really, <laughs> if I wasn't feeling nervous before, I certainly am now. I'm a, like Sally, I'm a criminal barrister. I do defence work and I have done for 23 years. I was appointed as a recorder, which is a part-time 
Crown Court judge in 2006 and appointed as Queen's Counsel in 2010. Uh, and a bit like Sally, I, I find myself asking the, the very same question, well, how did I get here? And I found myself asking that question in my Silk interview, and fortunately that didn't go against me. Um, <laughs> I'm from a state school background. I went to my local comprehensive school, and before I started, embarked on my career in the law, I felt that I was starting with three major obstacles as I saw them. First of all, gender, secondly, race, and thirdly, class. Um, and I felt that those were all obstacles that could stand in my way. Uh, and I want to tell you an anecdote, because it's something that I've had in my mind um, and has come back to me many times over the years, which is my very first careers talk when I was doing my A-levels, um, which I did at the local um, higher education college. And I went along to see Mr. Honey, rather improbably named in, in view of the advice that he was to give me, and he asked me what <laughs> career path I had in mind. And I said, well, I'm, I'm rather thinking of being a lawyer. I think I'm, I'm going to do a law degree. And Mr. Honey admittedly taught me maths at A-level, so that this may have coloured his opinion of me somewhat. But he said to me, well, I think you ought to set your sights on something that's rather more realistic for you. Have you thought about nursery nursing? Now, I don't take away from that as a career path because I, I have people close to me in my family who have pursued that. But the message that Mr. Honey was giving to me is you're not good enough to do that. You're not good enough to be in the law. It's not for people like you, it's for somebody else. Uh, and speaking Latin in courtrooms is another one of those things that reinforces that view. It's not for people who've gone to comprehensive schools who don't understand words like locus classicus, which I had to look up only yesterday, in fact. What's um, that mean? I, I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot, Gary. No, I'll have to I. look it up again. No, it's I just, gone straight I just out. To... It's gone straight my out of self. my head. Somebody, somebody else will have to help. Um, so in spite of Mr. Honey's advice to me, I decided that he didn't know really what was best for me and that I would remain undeterred. And so I, I did pursue a, a legal career. I did pursue a law degree. And, and then I went to a common law set. And I have to confess that initially, my career path was going to be, I, I wanted to be a lecturer. Um, but everyone else was applying for pupillage at bar school. I'd gone to bar school to get more experience, and I thought, well, that sounds quite a good thing to do, so I'll keep my options open. I'll apply for pupillage. And in fact, I got my pupillages lined up, and I thought, well, I'm not really sure this is what I want to do. And I told my father, who's very inspirational um, to all of us in our family, and I said, well, I don't think I really want to go to the bar because it's not for people like me. It's um, plagued by racism, sexism, every ism going. And I, I can honestly say that my expectation of the bar was far worse than, than what it was even then, and certainly to what it is now. I think the face of the bar has completely transformed over the, the 23 years that I've been in it. My father said, you can't be a defeatist, you've got to at least try, and so I, I did try. And in fact, a, a very big turning point for me was when I joined my ch current chambers, Garden Court Chambers, and at the time, I'm sorry that he's not here um, on the platform, Courtney Griffiths was co-defending with me, and Courtney said, you ought to apply to Garden Court. And interestingly, at the time, I was being prosecuted by Sally. <laughs> Um, who was at the time pregnant with triplets. Um, so a big inspiration as well there. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to apply to... <laughs> um, and so I, I did apply to Garden Court, and it's a, a large multidisciplinary set. The whole emphasis is on um, representing those who are disadvantaged. It's, it's very dear to my heart. I came into this profession not because I, I thought it was sexy or glamorous or because I wanted to make lots of money. I came into this profession because I thought, it, genuinely thought it's a really important thing to provide a, a representation for those who are disadvantaged for whatever reason. And, and that has remained with me always. I'm very pleased to be in the chambers that I'm in. In terms of, of inspiration to other people, I think the most important thing that we do at Garden Court is we do encourage people to come along and do mini pupillages. As Sally said, I'm always happy if people contact me and want advice, I'm always happy to, to offer that advice. Um, and in fact, we receive something phenomenal like 800 applications for pupillage per year 
for six pupillage places. That is breathtaking. And I'm one of many people who shortlist those applications because it's a colossal task to go through every one of them, and we do every single one. So in terms of what you should be looking to, to put down on any application form, I think, the first and most important thing for, for all women is learn the art of bigging yourselves up. We don't like to do it. We're always so shy about saying what we're good at. We, we think that in some way it's boastful, uh, and that's a, a big disadvantage that we have. We have to learn to play to our strengths and not be shy about saying what we're good at. Don't do an application, an entire application in poetry. That's a really bad idea, which <laughs> unbelievably I have seen on two occasions. It doesn't, doesn't score very highly, I have to say. And importantly, experience. Importantly, experience. Whatever your chosen field is, try to gain experience in that field. And don't be shy about saying what that experience is and outlining all the things you've gained from it. Well, th those aren't actually my tips. My, my top three tips are, are these. First of all, hard work. Um, going into a courtroom, as Sally will tell you, especially when you're a new silk and you're against an established um, male silk who's been doing the job 20 years, who may have a tendency to slightly dismiss you, you're going into a very difficult and potentially hostile environment. So hard work is the key because once you know that you've mastered your papers, it gives you a confidence that no one can take away. And if you know your papers better than your opponent, Absolutely. they cannot dismiss you. So number one, hard work. <coughs> number two, whatever you call it, whether it be networking, getting on with people, I think that is absolutely fundamental. Um, but above all else, I think, and I come back to Mr. Honey, who I've thought about so many times over the years, I'd so like to, to talk to him now and tell him <laughs> what I've achieved in spite of him thinking that I wasn't capable of doing it. So the most important thing is self-belief. And I, I want to um, finish with a quote from none other than Nelson Mandela. It's not where you start, but how high you aim that matters for success. And that, I think, is something we should all keep in mind. Thank you very much. Now that I've um, discovered that our judge is a football fan, there's a term which I know she should be familiar with, um, which I think applies to Judy, um, plays the game with a smile. I often say that about particular footballers. And Judy is somebody I love because she's always, always got a smile on her face when she's at work. And, you know, privately she'll say something which I perhaps can't repeat as it's going out live about her <laughs> opponent. But nonetheless, she plays the smile on herself and I, on her face. And that, I think it's half, half, or perhaps some measure of her success, actually, that people just love her and try not to give her too difficult a time. Angela Arnold, for whom we're most grateful. Thank you so um, much. Who's rushed here from South East London to replace Courtney Griffiths. And we know that we can surpass him quite frankly. Angela. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much to uh, the Inspirational You team for um, asking me yet again. Um, it didn't take much for me to say yes because I have been on a previous panel and what I am about is influencing and inspiring and just letting people know at ground roots basically that, um, you know, where you are now, you know, there is a springboard for you to get to the top. Um, it's about believing in yourself, it's about persistence, it's about endurance as well. Um, a bit about me, I'm a partner at a firm um, and also a consultant solicitor uh, for a smaller firm, a sole practitioner, and I'm about building. <coughs> Solicitors, uh, being a solicitor was not necessarily what I'd wanted to do. Um, my background is thoroughly working class state school, um, bit, uh, quite a, a rebel, to be honest. Um, did quite well at school, uh, then decided to fall in love, got married pretty young, had a child, and then wanted to do law. So I'm quite a realist in how I got to where I got to. It wasn't traditional. Um, once I decided, probably uh, had my child around 18, um, by the time she was five, husband in tow, um, I thought to myself, 
I don't think I want to be locked up with a small child for the rest of my life and be a housewife. Um, and law was something that I'd always had in my sight. Um, and yes, at school, you know, they'd said, OK, you know, if you want to be a lawyer, I think you'd better be better off being a secretary. So I, I totally uh, take your point. Uh, however, not one to be um, turned off in any way. Having my family, um, I thought to myself, OK, I've done the degree, um, but I didn't want any debt. Uh, so I went into a city law firm as a paralegal. Uh, worked my way up, frustrated with the law degree, looking at really good lawyers, good partners, but having to do humdrum jobs. Uh, but my mind on the prize was no debt. Got through that, got through my LPC, no debt, debt, hooray. Um, and um, uh, then got on to do a training contract at an older age. So uh, that was other thing that I'd had to overcome. Uh, being quite older than my contemporaries, uh, young people going in um, vacation placement. I got at a, quite a, a prestigious city firm um, and quite daunting when you find out that people applying for vacation placements are coming in from China and all over the world and this is a vacation placement. So uh, for me, uh, it was good. You know, opportunities come and you make the most of them. And that's something that I've, you know, kept up with and, and sort of adhered to throughout my career. Uh, moving on from there, uh, went into a traditional high street firm, worked my way up to the top, if you call partnership being at the top. A lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of responsibility, a lot of compliance. Uh, you know, really just keeping on my toes and ensuring that the people that work underneath you are well equipped. So not just about having the title, but uh, being able to impart and uh, treat those to take them up with you. Um, you know, as you climbed, you're, you're looking to have a legacy of trainee solicitors. Uh, you're looking um, to, to leave a history behind that's going to be something that you can look back on wherever, if you stay there or if you move on. I like to move on. And um, once I did move on, I took a partnership at another firm in the West End. Um, I was there for a couple of years. But I began to see law from more of a creative perspective, whereby um, they say that lawyers don't make very good business people. And um, I, in myself, it was something of a challenge to me. Uh, I then started to partner with organizations that were more to something that was personal to me, education uh, for the, the minorities or people that were quite having behavioral problems in school. So I used to, well, I approached Harren Brent Education Authority and asked if I could act as a mentor or in part or, or offer work experience at the firm where I was. And um, through that, I would go in and speak to them, uh, speak to children who were at difficult, a difficult age, probably 14 upwards, who weren't sure of what they wanted to do, but also about etiquette, the way you would act in a workplace, things that they wouldn't probably get uh, or may not have even been embraced in the schools through the careers teacher, etc. Um, not so much vocational, but, um, you know, grassroots of things that you need, behavioural, you know, things that would cause them to have some sort of stigma when they did come into the <coughs> workplace. Um, so for me, that was something close to my heart, and um, I still maintain uh, contacts with that. Due to the cuts in Brenton Harrow, that project has had to be sort of um, pulled out at the moment, but we are still in talks in seeing how we can be strategic. Also, another thing uh, with uh, the law was uh, using my position to uh, show the wider diaspora business-wise that we can partner with charities. So I uh, approached a charity called Carers Lewisham, because uh, that was where my law firm was based at the time, and um, approached the chairman there. 
uh, to give workshops um, supporting the carers, where, whether they could be young carers or older carers for, for those that were terminally ill, uh, young people who had to look after their terminally ill parents and so on, and give workshops in, say, power of attorney, uh, wills and probate, deputy ship, something that would be impacting at no cost, but just showing the legal side uh, not only as a commercial animal. So for me, um, that uh, epitomizes about my heartbeat for law. You know, they say, yes, I've been part a partner, but it was more than just monetary. It's more than just a title. And I think that's what's kept me within uh, the legal vocation, the, you know, and um, I continue to do that. I'm a consultant solicitor uh, at a, a small, uh, small firm, uh, a small practitioner. I've come in there as a consultant to help build. And I believe in building. Uh, it's a, a Turkish firm as well, so I'm trying to, to learn Turkish. I hear it's the, word, you know, it's the most difficult language to learn. But um, it's also imparting that. I mean, this lady is uh, quite thinking I'm quite mad, uh, but I like to build. I like to build, I like to impart, I like to influence, I like to encourage, um, but not only within my field, but try and reach out and not so that the, the wider community will see uh, law just as a, a money-making machine, uh, a mystery, so to speak, um, and that's me. I would think for myself, I'd say, think out of the box. Uh, you know, we're all successes waiting, uh, success is relative to exactly what you want to be, where, what your goals are. When you reach that goal, you've made that success. That is your success. So, um, you know, then you go on. So it's a series of successes, I would say. Setting your goals and as you springboard from one success to the other, even a failure, the fact that you get up again is a success. So it's, it's, it's really renewing your mind, your mindset, um, reaching for that which you think is un, uh, unattainable, but you have the steps that will make it achievable. Um, again, uh, which I think uh, my colleagues, it, it's a mixture of everything that they've said before, as each was going around the room, I was like, dang, I wanted to say that. <laughs> I, I wanted to say that. So, you know, they say the last will be the first. Um, but I, I, I agree uh, with everything that's been said here. Um, endurance, you know, yes, you may not be confident. We're all coming from different backgrounds. Um, and being at the top, I said, is relative to what you set yourself. Uh, keep persevering. Um, it's good to speak to people who have got uh, at the place where you want to be. Um, I always say, you know, stay with the fly with the turkeys, not with the chickens. Um, and you know, just keep being persistent. I don't know whether that's three or four or whatever, but um, <laughs> that's as much as I can give right now. But you know, I think you're in the right place at the moment, and I think this is a good a good starting point for, for all of you. So, you know, just keep, just keep keeping on. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> We've reached that part in, of the evening, in fact, where we're inspirational to borrow a phrase from Angela, like to build. We like to build a relationship with the audience because I suspect um, that there'll be a number of questions, queries, observations, comments, complaints, etc., etc. Not about this panel, of course, <laughs> um, but perhaps about some of your experiences in law, at law school, trying to obtain or maintain your legal career. Um, for questions, please, would you um, just stand up and perhaps just tell us um, what you're presently doing, whether you're training, whether you're an undergraduate, postgraduate, whether you have a successful career and just want to add to the advice that's been given. Um, please, anybody, questions, the first. Anybody, who's going to be brave enough? Can I, t oh, I thought I saw a hand there for a moment. 
Um, it's always this way. Oh, I do see a hand, but it's a man. <laughs> now, now, come on, well, women. If, if, this if, is if, what we're if, talking uh, about, some if, confidence. If, if, I, your hands I, I can see a woman right there down the centre. I'm going to come back to you, especially as you're wearing a pink shirt. I don't think I should discriminate. <laughs> um, right at the back there, if you could stand up, please, and just, just tell us what stage of your career progression that you are at, please. Hi, um, I'm from Lagadu, and I'm a Final year, are you studying LLB? Are you taking uh, a law yeah, degree? Yeah, LLB, European Legal Studies. All right. Do you have a question for a particular panellist or any of the panellists? Uh, or, or just, just any of the panellists, really. Um, just struggling to choose in between the bar and also being a solicitor, how do you decide your group and why? How do you decide your career between the bar and being a solicitor? For me, I know, because I talk a lot. Um, <laughs> but... Is there anyone you want to um, provide an answer to that question? Lucy? Um, one of the differences now, I think, from when we all qualified at different times is, is that there's um, far more crossover between the mm. two careers. Mm. Um, I, for instance, although I'm a solicitor, I've been an advocate all my life. Um, and it's certainly possible to, to um, be a, a, an advocate and talk, a, a solicitor and talk a lot. I'm the living proof <laughs> of that. It's not just at the bar. Um, I think that, and there's far more flexibility to be able to move between the two careers as well, um, so that people can start off as solicitors and then become barristers or, or the other way around. And the opportunities for people to work together have all changed since the Legal Services Act came in. So um, I suppose my, my advice to you would be um, try and work out what you want to be doing and then see if you can achieve that best by going to the bar or, or becoming a solicitor. Um, uh, I mean, naturally, I would say become a solicitor, but um, uh, I'm, I don't want to sort of um, impose that view on you too hard. But, but there is much more flexibility um, and, and crossover now than there ever used to be. Um, gentlemen in the pink shirt, uh, I'm going to ask the questions be kept relatively short so that we can get as many as we can. Oh, okay. uh, and just, just state what your, what your present stage is, please. Sure, I'm a technology strategist. I've just come here just to a technology strategist, a, a wannabe lawyer, uh, no, a has-been lawyer, <laughs> <laughs> your children want to be lawyers, <laughs> <laughs> this is inspirational you know, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding, so what, what's the question? LA law, and, um, LA. <laughs> you, 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 you have seen me in that, um, yes. Now, the question I want to ask is, what has been the single most challenge, uh, you know, the biggest challenge you've had and how have you overcome that? And the second question is, what aspect of law would you say is the most lucrative for people to get into? <laughs> 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 well, in my industry, you know, patent law seems to be a big thing, you know, with everything from each other. Um, so, um, ah, now we get to the bottom of this question, you're, you're thinking about transferring to the most lucrative yeah. area. Um, I, I think I'll take on the single most chal challenge that perhaps any, um, any of our panellists don't all rush. Um, I'm going to ask Judge Taylor because she told us a story about the challenges that she um, first encountered in applying to her chambers, which was predominantly male. And um, it seems that certainly you may have an appetite for challenge. Yes, well, when I first uh, applied, I think that the, probably the biggest challenge was getting in. Uh, and I think in those days, it, it was far more difficult in some respects and far easier in other respects than it is now. Um, the competition for pupillages in chambers is enormous. Mm. And a lot of you will be coming in with a large <coughs> amount of debt, uh, which you'll have from your um, university education, which we didn't have. So we were coming in, starting out, um, really without debt. Uh, and it was possible if you were... Um, applying as I was. In fact, the chambers that I applied for, there were eight pupils and there was effectively one place at the end of it over that year. And I think that that was the biggest challenge, was making yourself uh, the best and doing the best over that year, getting on with everybody, uh, making sure you did your work uh, right um, and uh, really sort of surviving um, what's a rather Darwinian approach over a year where everybody is pitted against each other. Um, so that probably is the greatest challenge. 
Although I have to say that I do sit in a court where I am the only woman judge, and there are 15 courts, and all the time that I've sat as a judge, I think there's only been one court I've sat at where um, there's been more than one woman judge. So it's lovely to have Judy, who sometimes sits with us as a recorder, uh, to come and keep us company sometimes, but it's um, uh, a feature that you have to get used to, and I hope won't last too long. Um, I'm going to pass, if you don't mind, and perhaps we can deal with it later insofar as the question about lucrative, and you can think about your future career then. Um, any other questions, please? Yes. Now, my question is related to what Judge Deborah just mentioned, sitting at the bench as a female and having a low ratio. I appreciate that Judy had mentioned that the face of the bar has changed as it relates to sexism and as it relates to discrimination as a lady, so to speak, and racism. But Sally mentioned some figures as it relates to becoming a silk. I believe you said eight to one. Yes. Um, I'm particularly interested in criminal law, and I noticed that in certain fields, especially in crime, the ratio of women entering the field is quite low. And I'd like to know why is that? And secondly, I'd like to know um, useful tips as it relates to becoming a successful applicant as a people. Okay, well, maybe Judy and I can do it between us because. Um, Judy and I both in our respective chambers sit on the committees which, which deal with tenancies and so on. Um, can I just mention one thing about the 8 to 1 ratio, that's in relation to silk. There are in mm. fact more women come in and in mm. at the bottom end of the bar than men. Mm. What the problem is, is keeping them. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the challenges yeah. there, it, it appears to me at least, <coughs> are, are the ones that mm. are hitting every woman mm. in every sector of society, mm. whether we are at the bar, whether we're working in industry, whatever, is how do we marry up a successful practice with our other responsibilities, our greater responsibilities, arguably, to kids, to families, to partners, to, to even caring for old, older parents. You know, those are, mm. those are big issues. That's why we're seeing the drop-off. The interesting thing that, that Deborah has been talking about, yes, there are still relatively few female judges. But that demographic is changing as people like Judy and I are coming through. I've sat as a part-time judge, as a recorder. I, I sit at the Bailey, I sit in serious sexual crime. I've done that since 1998. So there's quite a lot of movement. And we are seeing that the product of women coming in at the bottom, sticking around and getting through, but the demographic needs women to stay in it, to rise. And look, we're looking at a situation, we hope, where next year, potentially, we're going to see the first female lady chief justice. So life is moving on. And I have to say, and I give her particular credit, she has been an extraordinary help to every woman I know at the bar who's ever encountered. It's a woman called Heather Hallett, who has done nothing but be the embodiment of what I think we all need to do, which is reach out and actually help and advise younger women, women coming through, how to get through. Okay, so it is moving, but we have a responsibility to move it too. Um, tips for successful pupillage. You've got to keep banging on that door. You're not going to get in first time. You're, you're going to have to do first sixes, second sixes, third sixes, 26 sixes. Mm -hmm. But don't stop. If that's what you want to do, if your drive is to do what we do and represent and be... I think the biggest challenge for me is being the actual mouthpiece of, of the person I'm looking after, my mm. client, making his or her words real for them. So mm. if that's what you want to do, you'll feel it right in your, your guts. And <coughs> if you want to do it, just don't give up. And I'm sorry, it's tedious, it's frustrating, it's demoralising, but just keep going. Judy. I agree with everything that Sally said. I echo everything she's said. And I think one of the particular difficulties with criminal practice and is peculiar to crime is that it's very difficult to combine with having a young family. Now, Sally obviously had good support. She's got a huge number of children. And I, I'm a mother of twins. And I was very lucky in that my mother-in-law looked after my children when I was young. So I could stay at court till whatever time was required. I could do things that were in warned lists that didn't have um, fixed dates. 
Uh, it's no surprise that in our criminal team, we have lost, I think, four women with young families, four women from our team. And it's not a massive team. You're talking about maybe 40 people. And they've all gone over to different um, other specialisms within chambers. So they've gone into civil practice where they can do paper-based work. Um, they can work from chambers. They can work from home. And they can do fixed cases, whether it be civil actions against the police or whatever. The difficulty with junior <coughs> is that quite often you have things coming into the list at the last minute. You have mentions that come in. You have bail applications at the last minute. And it's really difficult, if not impossible, to combine that with... Uh, ha having a young family and having childcare. So childcare is colossally expensive. Criminal practice at the junior end is not phenomenally well paid, and so there's a real mismatch there. So it is a peculiar difficulty in crime to combine a young family and criminal practice. And, and we as a chambers are constantly thinking of how we can improve that. I mean, one of the initiatives we have is that when we, when we have meetings, which are on Sundays, we have a, a free crash. So people can come along, they've got um, childcare sorted out. That's not an expense, it's not an additional burden. But in terms of how you support women on a day-to-day -day basis, that's a real important challenge for all of us at the criminal bar. But I think that's a real problem. Uh, yes, can, I, can I just say something um, in, in relation to the women in positions in the judiciary? Because as a Judicial Appointments Commissioner, uh, the statistics are getting much better. And I think that Sally's absolutely right, mm -hmm. that since the Judicial Appointments Commission has started, uh, the uh, figures have uh, risen in every level of the judiciary by quite substantial numbers. It doesn't seem like it's moving very fast, but in fact, it, it is. So, for example, in relation to recorders of part-time judges, since before the JSC and to now, that's gone from 17% to 31%. So that's at the level where people are coming in and who are going to move up through the system. It's the first step on the ladder. The second point I wanted to make was really what, something which Judy was saying, which is that, to some extent, it is easier in other areas of law. I was a civil practitioner. And the story that I told about having support within chambers is, is true. Uh, but also, and I'm just going to tell you a brief anecdote, which is that um, having backup is so important if you do have children. Because uh, I had a situation where my husband was in South Africa. My um, nanny was sick. Um, I was in the Court of Appeal. And so I rang my friend, who lives up the road, um, and her nanny, who was my backup nanny, was also sick and she was just about to ring me um, and we rang two of our friends absolutely no way that they could assist so she who was a partner in a magic circle firm cancelled her meetings for the day and she looked after my children uh, and uh, when I came home from court in the evening I looked after her children and she rescheduled her meetings for the evening and so we ended up supporting each other in that way for three days Wow. because it was the only thing we could do. And so you do need backup, and that was a situation in which my backup, backup, and backup <laughs> failed. And, and we were left to look after ourselves. And it's, uh, I think, a tribute, really, to the <coughs> do help each other. Um, could I just add something yes. about, <coughs> about diversity in the judiciary? Um, I, I think that the, all sorts of diversities, um, the diversity balance are, are improving, as, as has been said. Um, one of the things that the JAC is very keen to do is to encourage young solicitors to think about a career mm. on the bench. Um, it's it's um, not traditional. <coughs> yeah, it is traditional for barristers. It's not traditional for solicitors. Um, and the bar, um, because it's a, a, a very cohesive profession, um, is, is absolutely brilliant in helping young barristers identify what they need to do to fit themselves to get on the bench. Um, solicitors are not as good as that. Um, we're a much bigger profession, we're much more dispersed, and it's not traditional. So if any of you are planning to be solicitors or are solicitors and are thinking about maybe one day I'd like to be on the bench, um, you need to start thinking about it early. There's no point in starting thinking about when you're 40. That's too, well, it's not too late necessarily. Start early, um, get advice. Um, talk about the things that you might want to do, look at the JAC website and start positioning yourself um, so that when you feel ready to apply, um, you've got the right sort of career behind you. Can I just say one thing on this, which is um, actually a message that was given out by um, Equality and Diversity at, at the bar, actually at the highest level. The feature to this is 
you have got to apply. Mm -hmm. uh, and that ties into everything we've all said, self-belief mm -hmm. and doing it. Mm -hmm. So please don't sit there thinking, oh, I can't do it. If you don't apply, you're not going to get an interview. It's, it, you're not going to be the judge. <coughs> and you won't be putting a more positive spin, a more positive face mm -hmm. on the diversity issue. So yeah. put your application in. What's the worst that can happen? You don't get it. Well, mm -hmm. try next time. Mm -hmm. You know what? How many people have to apply for jobs several times over to mm -hmm. get the job they want? Mm -hmm. Please do not fail at the first hurdle. But we're definitely improving. Um, but at the same time, there is a great deal more improvement that needs to be made. I have to say, diversity mm -hmm. and judiciary. I want, I've been wanting to show off some of my research, which I'm very grateful to my pupil who's here for. Um, and I think in 1998, the figures suggested <coughs> female judges numbered 10.3%. In 2011, the figures were 22.3%. However, so in relative terms, a great deal of improvement has been made. However, apparently the current total, and this is by the Council of Europe, who carried out a European-wide study, suggests that the current total of female judges in England and Wales is a total of 23%. Only Azerbaijan and Armenia are lower. So we are doing better, we are doing better but there is much more, much more that to be done. Question there to the left. So if you could stand, please, and just tell us what stage you're at, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pamela Bibby, and I'm a law graduate. Um, I have been Judge Taylor touched on it a little bit um, about grants uh, for the bar. I just wanted to find out a little more information about that. Just before um, that question is answered, and £2 million sounds like a fantastic amount of money to me, for those of you. You don't have private un incomes, and you all look so fabulously wealthy, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, but insofar as my research tells me, um, and I'm looking at the level of student debt, 22.5% of students actually have no debt. And that may be something to do with the £2 million that Judge Taylor has in her purse. <laughs> Please make sure you apply just yes, can I just say that um, there are, if you're coming to the bar, there are four winds of court, all of whom hand out uh, scholarships. Um, the um, three inns, other than Inner Temple, do them I think, entirely on uh, need combined with merit. But the Inner Temple gives out some scholarships on merit only, so they're not means tested, a very limited number. And uh, the scholarships cover both uh, the GDL year, if you're going to transfer from a non law degree, but also the BPTC year. But they don't go any further than that. And after that, it's individual chambers which offer pupillage awards. They're all competitive, but um, as I say, uh, need is taken into account as well as ability, and it's a combination of the two. And if you don't apply, you must be mad if you're coming to the bar, because you do have a lot of debt, um, and the inns are very, very keen to encourage people to apply, they have the money to support people through those years, and uh, the um, effect of it is that it may cover your, GD, uh, your GDL year, or it may cover your um, uh, BPTC fees. So, for example, in the Inner Temple, the top scholarships have just gone up to £22,000, um, and they're quite substantial grants which are given on the basis of uh, need as well. So. Don't ignore what's available, uh, and if you're going to join an inn, have a look at the scholarship scheme available from each uh, of the four inns. If you're going to do a particular type of work, for example, chancery, you may want to join one of the other inns other than inner. Um, but uh, they're all available to uh, have a look at and uh, set out very clearly what the scholarship awards are. And individual chambers in the pupillage handbook also set out what scholarships they offer what uh, pupillage awards they offer, and some of them are very substantial indeed. Yeah. Uh, so on the issue of scholarships, research, 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 as some of you may know, it's always better to spend somebody else's money than your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, question there, please, and again, if you could stand up and just tell us um, your stage, please. Um, I'm a law graduate. I just finished a postgraduate master's degree, which is kind of like GDL, but a bit longer. And uh, one of the stumbling blocks that I've come across in trying to find a training contract is that most of the vacation schemes seem to be aimed at undergraduates. And so I've, I found it very difficult to get legal experience. I've got almost none on my CV. Um, and I'm going sort of 
charity experience, publishing experience, anything that I can get just to sort of fill my time. So I guess my question would be for the solicitors on the panel, what advice can you offer for graduates like me who are finding it difficult to get the experience they need in order to get this training content? Can I come to Sarah? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to answer that. You were about to answer that, weren't you? Yeah, because yeah, okay. I, I completely understand how, how that feels, because I was in a, in a similar position. Um, any experience <coughs> is good experience. That may sound trite, uh, but uh, I was interested yeah. in, in the comment about um, solicitors don't make good business people. I, I think that's nonsense. I think solicitors make some of the best business people. Uh, and if you can get experience working in a charity or anywhere where you can then show through your application that those skills you picked up there are transferable skills that you can use as a, as a solicitor. So, for example, being able to construct um, a coherent argument if you're arguing with um, a funder for some funding for a project. That's a skill that, that you need as a solicitor. Uh, being able to write a letter or, or construct a, a properly worded email. Um, being able to be confident in, in speaking in public. So th there are so many different skills that you can pick up in different professions that are just as transferable. But then make that clear on your CV or in your covering letters or in your application forms. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know how difficult it is, and it's, I, I do sympathise. Uh, Angela, you look like you may wish yeah, to come in. Yeah, I mean, I, I did, uh, huh. you know, I knocked on every door. I mean, I did secretarial. Anything that smelt legal, I tried to get in there. Um, <laughs> so um, I would just say, just keep persevering. And I would agree, you know, um, as I said, back in the day when I was trying to, to, to make it good, um, it was said, you know, oh, solicitors, you know, we're, we're, we're okay on procedural and quite mechanical, but not quite uh, au okay fait with business. And, um, but as I said, you know, where you are at the moment, you have experience um, and everything is transferable now. I mean, law is so diverse, everything is transferable. Keep knocking on doors, you know, and um, use your, your, your colleagues or your pet, your you know, your family, or so on. But just just keep knocking and make whatever you have on paper. Um, present it in such a way that you're going to offer it as an additional, uh, as, as something beneficial to whoever you're you're, you're going to. Uh, that's that's all I could say on that. <coughs> all right. Also, best of luck. I, yes. I, just, I, would, I would also like to say, um, think about it perhaps from a different angle mm. and think about. For example, the firm where I work, which is a kind of multidisciplinary uh, practice, really. And sometimes you can get into law through a kind of very strange route. And going into a different kind of role in a firm that is quite large and has many, many different opportunities, you can find yourself, for example, doing compliance or risk or regulatory or quality uh, or contract management, all these things have a sort of legal aspect. And if you find something that you enjoy, you may be happy with that. If you still want to um, qualify to be a solicitor, often those big firms will sponsor you. Once once you're in the door, um, the opportunities can sometimes present themselves. Carol, just before I quickly go to Lucy on this, um, most frequently when I come into contact now with undergraduates, um, and I can understand it to some extent. They're really about show me the money. And they're really about places such as Deloitte and City Hall, <coughs> which is where, because they've all heard the rumours about legal aid, all right, and unfortunately some of those rumours are true. And there's a perception, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, and you're going to tell me in a moment, I hope, that in order to gain um, a placement or a tra gain, gain, gain training contract in city law firms and places such as Deloitte, um, it's purely about academia, and what experience you gain up to that point is neither here nor there, true or untrue. Definitely, what, what can those definitely buddy, untrue. No, I mean... What, what experience can, can those who are looking to go into the city, and I suspect many are, um, what, what should they be doing? Because I get asked this question all the time. Yeah, I'm frequently asked this question, and frankly, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, Academia is, you know, being academic and being good at what you do and, and getting the, those exam results is obviously the first step. But actually, um, you know, as Judy said, for every role that's out there, you get hundreds of CVs. And these days, you know, everybody's got 
four or five A levels, everybody's got all the, the, the sort of, they've ticked all the academic boxes. So when you're looking at CVs, you're looking for a bit of a spark, you're looking for that difference. How can you differenti differentiate yourself from, from everybody else? And that's through being an all-round person, being more rounded, having experience of life that you can bring to bear, as, as we've just said, all these experiences, they all add up to you being a well-rounded person. And when you go for interviews, you'll be able to talk about things that interest other people, football or you know whatever it is. You have to be able to communicate, you have to be able to sell yourself, and you have to be able to differentiate yourself. It doesn't necessarily happen through you know, having the best exam results. It mm. happens through being the sort of person that's going to fit into that organisation and be able to um, rise, you know, to the top of the ranks, really. Lucy, can I ask you to be very quick on this one? Because I know there are some other questions. Contact the Law Society. <laughs> <laughs> get, your thumb, get your three inches of thumbs up. <laughs> now, I, I know that we're, we're being pressed for time. Um, I just wanted to ask a very quick question. Yes. Oh, Charlie I'm, was yeah. asked the question. Are you I'm not thinking practicing. about changing careers? Um, actually, was the first career I, I, I uh, thought about, actually, when I was um, at school. For those of you who don't know, Charlene White, ITV News, occasionally. <laughs> but I actually want to direct the question to both of you. Both of you grew up in Wales. None of you have a Welsh accent. Um, so I'm talking about it for almost on an aesthetic level regarding women working in law. Was that a conscious decision for you to change your accents, do you think there's certain things about the person you were growing up in Wales that you've changed since coming to London and being as successful in law firms that you are? That could be, I know, the way that you dress, the way that you hold yourself, those kinds of things. But sometimes women don't always think about how important that is when they're working in, in a world such as law or business. Change accent? How dare you? How dare you? To assimilate. Now that it's been said, I can hear. Mm. I can hear. Yeah. I can hear. Well, here's a question for me, because I moved out of Wales in most of my education. Um, I moved when I was about seven. But we spoke Welsh at home, so I still speak a bit of Welsh. So yeah, I'm not sure if that qualifies me yeah. on the accent front. But, it, you know, it was a very long time ago. Is the other thing. I um, definitely, I, yeah. so, sorry to interrupt, yeah, but I agree you. with you. I mean, I'm totally proud of being Welsh. It's, the, it's you know, who I am. Mm -hmm. It's a very big part of that. I, first thing I did when I came to London, I didn't know anybody, uh, joined the London Welsh um, Association, and that was 20 uh, something years ago, and I'm still a member now. And so I, I think your roots and your background are so very important. You in, in, terms of, in terms of the way you then conduct yourself within a professional environment, things like, you know, hair and makeup, that sort of thing. It's important. Yeah. You know, um, it's, hey, it's important. You, you, and the other thing is, as, as one of the great jobs that I get in chambers sometimes, which is, I don't know why I get clobbered with it, but I'm known for being fairly blunt. I have been, on occasions, Having to go and talk to some of the pupils and say, I'm really sorry, but this isn't going to work. You've, you've, got to, you've got to look smart. We are the full, we're the face of the profession. Mm -hmm. We're what the public see. When people go to court, we're what they see. So be smart, look good. Um, you don't have to wear makeup, you don't have to do anything, but just look pretty smart. Mm -hmm. so. I can see a hand. Another question. Did I see? Oh, we have one right at the front here. It's more of a, <coughs> sorry, it's just more of a statement on. Was it me or something? Uh, and, and actually, if you sorry. could just stand up. Um, Charlie managed to get away with that. Why? You um, just stand up, please. And if you could, because I've been told to, and I okay. follow rules, as anybody who knows me knows. Um, <laughs> if you could just tell us um, about your current state. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Amma Afrifache. I work at Deloitte, and I'm a colleague of Carol. Um, can I sit down now and talk? Just, to stand uh, just tell us what the question is. Um, it's not a question, it's more of a statement along the question you asked about city firms and academia yes. and kind of going on to Caroline's point, Carol's point. Sorry. Um, um, I think it depends on what route you're taking. If you're going through the graduate recruitment route, yes, it's a rigorous sort of process where they do look at your academia. But at different stages, if you pass that, again, it's coming back to the interview stages and how you can actually impress the people that you're interviewing. But I'm also, I mean, I studied law, I decided not to be a solicitor, um, and I went on to do a, a, a Master's in Public Relations. But for me, I used my law background to get into 
other legal areas. And I also looked at experience higher entry levels. And as Carol said, once you get into a firm, it's just navigating and finding the opportunities there in which you can then go on to do or follow on to your legal sort of course. So it's kind of going, going back to that city. I'm academia. very grateful for that information. Thank you very much. There's a question. I was just going to say something. Forgive me. Yeah. Can just I just say something But in answer to Charlene? I think it's all about appropriate dress. And one of the things that I say to girls in schools, what you wear to the disco, what you wear to, or what you wear to clubs, what you wear <laughs> shopping, whatever, I have to show my age there, haven't I? <laughs> what you wear to go shopping with your mates is not what you wear when you go to an interview mm. or what, when, you, when you present yourself in court. And it's really important, as Sally says, to look the part mm. and to dress appropriately. And I can see looking around you that you're all wearing appropriate dress for this evening and some of it some of you may feel that it's a bit of a uniform wearing a black suit but it is a bit of a uniform mm -hmm. uh, and we wear uniforms mm -hmm. in all walks of life and from my point of view looking at an advocate if I see a messy advocate I think probably their arguments are a bit messy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I want to see somebody who's neat they don't have to look like they've got their makeup on or whatever but it, they've got to look the part <coughs> well I must confess I don't usually wear my makeup <laughs> <laughs> So, so maybe, maybe that's why I'm not being well received. Um, Amelia, Amelia Fossa Heaney, who yes, might know. Mr. Green. Yes. Um, I'm a barrister at Carmelite Chambers, and um, what, I've got two questions really. Sorry. Um, first question is about networking and just how important the panel feels that is in each of their given professions. And the second one is does the panel think that other women? in their professions are probably their harshest critics. Ooh, yeah. I'd like to take that question first, in fact. And I'm being told um, by Sonia that we have about five minutes. Um, so can somebody, yes. Can I take the harshest critics Please, one? yes. Um, no, is the answer to that. Oh, That's okay. not been my experience. Um, I, I made a little list here earlier um, about women I know in senior positions uh, across the legal profession. I know women in senior positions in music industry, um, the Royal Opera House, it, the, the, the current head of legal at, at the Royal Opera House is female, Big Lottery Fund, Girls' Day School Trust, Sport England. There are, there are women in senior positions everywhere. Um, within the legal profession and that I come into on a day-to-day -day basis and I haven't felt that any of them have been particularly critical I have found only support from women at those levels. Okay. Networking, does anyone to... <laughs> yes, I, I'd like to say something about networking and, and, and um, for, for solicitors um, I think that uh, when you're uh, um, an LPC graduate or when you're doing the LPC or when you're newly qualified Joining the junior lawyers division is really important and the reason why I think it's important is that you will get information before it becomes official information. You're talking to people, you're networking, they're telling you that there's, you know, they're leaving their job um, or somebody else is leaving, there's going to be a vacancy, you don't have to scroll through all the, all the um, uh, the ads, uh, the, the job sites and so on, you, you, you start to get a sense of, of what's going on and you also start to get a sense of where you might want to work. So if you're eligible to join the junior lawyers division, I would do it straight away. It's very friendly um, and, you, and you will get a lot, of, a lot of information that will help you in developing your, your career at the earlier stages. Have we, Sonia, have we got some time for any... Two more questions, and they should be short questions. One question at the front here, one question towards the back there. If I could come to you after. Yes, if you could just tell us what stage you're at. Good evening, um, members of the panel. I just want to, firstly, I want to say thank you to Sonia. I think she's a very great human being. Um, wow. My name is Abby, Abiola Info Yusuf. Um, I'm a foreign trained lawyer. I had my law degree from the London Metropolitan University in this country. Then, but I had a 2-2, so I couldn't get any job. So rather than stop, I decided to do some research. Then I discovered I could go back, go out and leave the country to, practice, uh, to, to take the bar exams in another country where I could become a barrister and a solicitor, which is what I am now. So I went to Nigeria. All the savings I had, plus my, my mom's money, everybody, they gave me money, I went back to Nigeria. So I attended the Nigerian law school and I took the bar exam, it was very, very difficult. Then. Um, I practiced for one year. I just came back, so I really don't know. I'm a bit confused. I really don't know where to go. What I'm doing. Um, I just need. Um, I just need um, encouragement. I just need to know where, where I am really. 
Well, I would like to practice basically, that's all I want to do. What area of law are you considering practicing? Mostly criminal, but then um, I'm a challenge lover. I love, I can do anything basically. I'm open to any, <laughs> anything, but mostly criminal, but then I, I love, I love it, a bit of challenge. Would you forgive me for a moment? It sounds like um, you may want to approach one of our panellists at the mm -hmm. end of this. Um, okay. I see some heads nodding. All right, so they won't ignore you as they're going for the wine. Um, <laughs> so, if, if you if, can, you forgive me, please. Can we just come back from the no party to approach one of the panelists no and they will keep that question in their mind? Because I just want to maybe take a, a last short question um, because our, our time is nearly up. But I, I had to say that David did be sitting on questions. I like, <laughs> I had to say that. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Catherine. I'm a training assistant. I'm just following on from something that Lisa made about the deal. I'm actually here as a representative of the Junior Lawyers Division, so if anyone wants to come and talk to me um, later about how you can get involved in that case with that, please do. Um, my question was um, whether the panel are concerned about the impact that increasing fees and level of debt law sheets are going to have on diversity in the profession? Yes. Yes, Lucy, perhaps we can come to you in your capacity as President of the Law <laughs> Yes, Society. We're, we're extremely concerned about it. But what you need to know, I mean, this may not be much use for you guys because you've already got to a certain level, but what you need to know is that there's a, an education and training review going on at the moment um, across the three professions of solicitors, barristers, and uh, um, silexes. <coughs> Um, and um, almost certainly what's going to emerge out of this is um, a, a, a more structured way for non-graduate entry to the profession. Um, and uh, we think that this is going to, because there used to be non-graduate entry to the profession, um, you know, people of my um, generation can remember that there's one alternative was doing five-year articles. Um, and there are lots of uh, practicing solicitors at the moment, senior solicitors, who went that route and they're, you know, highly regarded. So there's probably going to be a way in like that. Um, which will help people um, because you're, you're qualifying while you're working, you're not getting into debt, um, the firm that you're working for is, is, is going to see you through, as it were. Um, but yes, it is a really serious problem and we're very worried about it. And perhaps even more so in the times, in times of austerity when um, money lenders, banks principally, are perhaps not so free um, with loans in a way that they, they once were. And I can see some heads nodding, so maybe achieving that loan may be quite difficult now. Um, Sonia, who's presently my boss, um, can I ask any further question or is, um, must I thank our panel for their participation and invite the audience to perhaps approach them if they want to outside? Is that what I should say next? <laughs> My time, our, our time is up. Well, um, can we thank our wonderful panel, please? <laughs> One of the things that Inspiration you, know, you more generally tries to achieve, and certainly insofar as this particular seminar is concerned, is to ensure that personal stories of success and so-called failure are actually communicated, because we hope that somewhere it will resonate with one or more people in the audience and they can think, hmm, perhaps that's me, perhaps that's my story. And that's why we have, I, I hope, what is a re relatively diverse panel um, who have contributed this evening. They've been a fantastic panel. You've been a fantastic audience, um, better than the men last year, I may say so. And um, please, 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 oh, I'm just being handed an evaluation form. I think you should fill this out um, at some point during this evening before you leave. And um, our panellists will hopefully have some time, um, as we've spoken about networking and socialising, to join you outside. Um, Sonia, I think you may have some closing remarks. Yep, I'd just like to thank you all for coming along. Um, we have around half an hour or so to network outside, and then we do have to vacate by nine o'clock, like, it has to be gone. We have a bad habit of overextending our stay at many events, and the conversation tends to flow and flow and flow, and we, we would really like to come back to the Supreme Court. So if you can, once you've <laughs> grabbed whoever you'd like to grab, um, it might be easy in some instances to also exchange cards as, as quickly as you can, because we normally end up with a long queue, everybody trying to grab everybody, but we, we've just got until nine o'clock. 
Um, I'd like to say thank you to Deloitte for sponsoring this evening, as well as thanking Ben from the UK Supreme Court. Um, we organise our talks on a voluntary basis. We are a voluntary organisation. Everybody that you see standing around volunteers their time. Everybody that is here today has come along and volunteered their time. And, and that means a great deal to me. It means a lot to be here today. And um, more importantly, doesn't it look good to see all these women sat in these judges' chairs? Yeah. <laughs> look at the president is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> So one day, me. one day, I, I believe you put it out there, then it will happen. So that's what I'm trying to do. So, you know, you never know one day um, this will be and, and can be our reality. Um, so all of the judges, everyone, all the judges, see, <laughs> all of the speakers, thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you for being so honest and so transparent. Um, I recognise that you are all very busy and I recognise that it takes a lot to get into your diaries and so I appreciate you coming along and helping I guess also to make history in a way because um, how often do we have this many powerful women under one roof being willing to share and give back. Um, to all of the staff that are here, thank you very much. Um, again, as usual, you're bombarded with emails and texts and tweets from me at one o'clock and two o'clock in the morning. But it's only because I'm so passionate about trying to help others to try and change the professions that are challenging and competitive. And the only way we're going to get ahead if we start, is if we start to just break down our own barriers, which is often fear and the willingness to accept what position we're in. And I just don't think we need to. We're in a position where we're educated enough, we're connected enough, and we're hungry enough to want more than we've got. So this is a testament. You're all here on a freezing cold November night. We can do it, and we are. So thank you. Um, you've all got feedback forms. It's really important to us that you complete the feedback forms. Um, all the speakers have a feedback form as well, because it's really important that they're also a That's it, Gary, you too. Sorry. Um, <laughs> that we hear what works, what doesn't work, what you would like, and what events yes, and what talks we should hold in the future. Um, this was broadcast live, so this is the first time that we've actually live streamed one of our events. So um, hopefully when we get a copy of the footage, we'll be able to put that onto our website and you can also play that back yourselves. Um, I think that's it in terms of what I've got to say, because I can talk for England as well, and I'm, I'm not going to tonight because of what you've all just to, to grab a glass of wine and to really network with one another. There are lots of key people here in the audience, so don't just assume that everybody that's on the panel are the only routes in which you can try and get ahead or know what else to do. There are, I could start pointing out people, but then I'd embarrass them and they probably wouldn't appreciate it, but there, there are a lot of people. Uh, actually, I will point out, for those of you who are solicitors and barristers and who we are in a position to offer advice and assistance to those who want a career, hands up, please. Oh, stand up, please. Stand up, please, furthermore. Okay, so those are the people that you need to speak to um, towards the end, okay? Um, networking, helping, your, helping each other out, sisterly love. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask politely if you could all um, vacate the call. This is just so that we can quickly film our speakers just for about three or four minutes and then they will come out and they'll join you for refreshments afterwards. Okay, you can be first to the drinks. Thank you very much. Thank you.